Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. All right, we ready to get this ad recorded? Yeah, sure, let's do it. Wait, where's Dan? Eh, don't worry about it, I'll get him in post. All right then, let's get things started. Hello, and welcome to the Fire Pit Podcast. I'm Josh. And I'm Tom. We're just three guys from Ohio who like to hang out, sit around, and watch movies. Then one day, we found ourselves asking, what's more fun than watching movies? Talking Talking about about them. (laughs) (laughs) So every six weeks, we pick a film. Ah! Guys, 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 guys. The Chief wants us to get a superhero to guest host on the Superman episode. Oh, God. Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. We're taking Jimmy Stewart to the shootest. John Wayne to True Grit. Robert Duvall to Days of Thunder. Tom Cruise to The Mummy. Russell Crowe to The Quick and the Dead. Gene Hackman to Superman. Fly into the hero's journey with Tom, Dan, and Josh and race faster than a speeding bullet towards the superhero films of superhero films, Superman! You will believe that a fire pit can fly! Greetings, bots and listeners, and welcome, really, this time, to the fire pit. I'm Dan, hero name Enforcer, and we begin flying high on the hero's journey this week. Wow. Wow. I mean, our fifth journey is now underway, and we honestly couldn't be more excited. But before we get to 1978's Superman, we need to get the hell out of 1939. So as per the rules, we've taken an actor or an actress from our last film and moved them on to this one. And now to tell us who we're watching, and what we're watching, I turn things over to Josh. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. I'm Josh. Hero name, The Quadratic Equation. No, no. Read the script. Uh, I'm Josh. Hero name, The Calculus Professor. Absolutely not. Hard veto. God damn it. Okay. I'm Josh. Hero name, Numbers. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Better. Fuck you guys. And last week, we watched Jimmy Stewart, well, a young Jimmy Stewart, pass out from exhaustion, trying to spark reason into Congress in 1939's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Trust us, Jimmy, we know the feeling. Tonight, though, we follow Jimmy Stewart as he plays opposite of another legend of cinema, one Mr. John Wayne in 1976's The Shootist, notable for being John Wayne's last film. And to tell us more about that and give us a rundown on the film, I'm going to go ahead and send it over to you there, Thompson. Well, thank you, Josh. And hello, everyone. I'm Tom, hero name Funny Bone. Ha 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 ha. How's that for a hero thing? No, no. Moving on. Who, who Moving on. <laughs> As mentioned by Josh, or should I say numbers, tonight we are watching The Shootist. Like Josh said, notable for being John Wayne's last film. Also stars Jimmy Stewart in the now third film we've covered, and a young Ron Howard, who you may know as director of our episode 9's Apollo 13, and one Lauren Bacall of Big Sleep and a bunch of other Humphrey Bogart films. This movie, which we're talking about here, uh, was released on August 20th, 1976, at a runtime of about 100 minutes from the United States. The budget... We couldn't find. There are no numbers on how much it cost to make this film, but it did earn a box office of about $13 million. And it has a Rotten Tomato score of 86% and an IMDb of 7.6 out of 10. So it's about a decent middle-of-the-road film from what we're seeing. It should be noted, though we couldn't find any numbers, and I couldn't find any numbers, I guess this film was kind of a bomb. When it was released. Um, I don't know if any of you were able to read about that. Hmm. Also, it generally, no one liked this film. Most of the people that had to, uh, that were brought on, like Jimmy and them, did it as a favor to John Wayne. Who also didn't like it. Like, he wasn't happy with it. 
Yeah. And some of these people did Genghis Khan. So if they did Genghis Khan and this is a film that they're like, oh, God, why did we make this film? That's, oof, I don't know, guys. But with knowing that, at least, and how much was going in, uh, Dan, what are you thinking about this film? What are your expectations? I said last night that I've seen this movie, and then I realized that I have not seen this movie all the way through. In fact, I don't even think I've ever actually watched it, other than maybe walking through the room and seeing a little bit of it on TV. And... It's got an 86% and a 7.6 out on IMDb, but I remember my dad didn't like this movie, and he loved John Wayne films, and my mom doesn't like this movie, and she also loved John Wayne films, and a couple co-workers today that really like John Wayne also don't like this movie, so I got to say my expectations are kind of low, but maybe I'll get some enjoyment out of it. I don't know. It could be a little jewel in the crown, but uh, I'm not sure. What I'm looking forward to, though, is... This movie is very telling in that it's John Wayne's last film, mm-hmm. and it's 1976 is when this movie came out. And we're in the twilight now of the Western and as dominating box offices across America. Mm-hmm. And it's almost symmetry that this is John Wayne's last film. And he dies three years after this movie came out. And the Western genre and its popularity pretty much dies with this film. Like, it's kind of interesting because Star Wars comes out a year later and changes Hollywood's focus dramatically from then on out. I don't know. That's what I'm looking forward to. I'm kind of looking forward to watching an end of an era. What about you, Josh? What are you thinking about this movie? I really wanted to say one thing real quick before I got into my expectations, but you mentioned symmetry, and I wanted to do a little bit of symmetry in this podcast. We're on episode 34, so exactly 17 episodes ago. We watched another amazing film from the year 1976, Swashbuckler. Oh, shit. It's been 17 episodes since our episode 17, and we're watching another movie from 1976. But that movie was terrible. Oh, the God. The symmetry hold. <laughs> oh, God. And we none of us have seen this film either. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> this one's based off of a book, too, like Swashbuckler. Oh, no. Oh, God. Cause, and, and didn't Swashbuckler get like a six or something? Yeah, I think it's about the same IMDb score, too. Oh, six, no! Six out of ten. Uh, yeah, six out of ten, oh. although much lower in Rotten Tomatoes. It's like a 44% or something in Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, 44 so. and a six out of ten. So Okay. Symmetry, guys. I'm just I'm calling it now. Symmetry. <sighs> so, but I would have to say that my expectations on this film are pretty low. I have never been a huge fan of Westerns. I think this will actually be my first John Wayne movie all the way through. So I, I really don't have anything else to say. I don't know anything about this movie. And seriously, I, it's probably my shortest expectations ever. That Those are my expectations. They're really low, and I don't <laughs> like Westerns. I, I, I could try to stretch this out, but I'm not going to. So, Tom, <laughs> before I repeat myself a fourth time, what are your expectations? <laughs> well, I'm just curious, Josh. Do you like Westerns? Have you ever seen a John Wayne film? No and no. <laughs> I mean, Yes. Now that you mentioned all the symmetry there, Josh, I was a little cautious but hopeful. Now I'm not so much hopeful. Oh, God. And this is Friday the 13th when we're watching this film. Uh, Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, boy. This might be an interesting start to this journey. Just looking in the past of this, looking at this film, I was mixed even before you said that, Josh. I mean, we got quality actors here. John Wayne. I mean, he's the best John Wayne to ever be John Wayne since John Wayne. Yeah. We've, we've talked up and down about that fellow. This one's got Harry Morgan, who we know as Colonel Potter from MASH. And I've never seen him in anything else, so I want to see him in something. Scatman Crothers, Hidden Gem, Lauren Bacall, Murder on the Orient Express, Big Sleep. Come on, this, this lady brings gravitas in everything she's in, even when it's a shitty film. So we got that, but none of them want to be in this film. Mm-hmm. So that's... That's going to be hard. Uh, just reading what went into this film, like we talked last time about Masters of the Universe and some of those other films where they kept cutting the budget and making things cheaper, cheaper. This seemed like they had the same problems. So there's that. Also, the writer, Scott Hale and Miles Hood Swarthout. Yeah, none of them did really anything. I think Scott Hale did General Hospital episodes before this. But at the same time, we got a quality director. It's got Don yeah. Siegel. He did Dirty Harry and Invasions of the Body Snatcher and a whole bunch of other stuff. Go through his IMDb listeners and everyone here and be like, I've not heard of that film, but I want to see it. I definitely want to see that. 
so Lisa Director's going to be good. And this came out after Dirty Harry, so he proved himself. So, ah, uh, oh, boy. Now I'm really not sure about this. This is going to be a rough one. I said before, I like when we watch films that none of us have seen, but there is a peril to that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I will say this. The movie may not be as popular with some of the cast of the movie, but the director always stood by it, that it was a pretty, that he was able to make a good movie, what it has. And it does have a near 90% on Rotten Tomatoes, unlike going into like Swashbuckler, which was less than 50. So Mm -hmm. this one might actually be better than we think it might be, but I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, it's kind of weird when I can't even find a budget of how much this movie cost when I'm researching it. Like Mm -hmm. how much did this movie cost to make? I mean, Apparently, though, it was really low because the, apparently most of the movie is shot indoors because they couldn't even afford to shoot outdoors for a lot of the movie. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But have fun with that. And we've we've seen films that we were iffy on, like Explorers and such, but it turns out, oh, shoot, we like this film. So we'll see how it goes. I'm hoping. Knocking on wood, but oh, boy, I'm just sitting that bar on the ground and just letting it stay there. But I wonder what other people thought about this film. Well, mm-hmm. you're not going to know because it's my turn to do trivia, and I didn't do the usual trivia. Well, no, wait, wait. Why is Nigel doing the quiz? I won last week, remember? Josh, we've been over this a hundred times. Go back and listen to the episode. I know. I, clearly, I know. Yeah. I, we stopped counting when I was in the lead. I won. That's not how it works, and you know so this. I've got, I've got a quiz, and I'm going to go ahead and give it now. Uh, okay, I'm taking this. The people I... have spoken. Yes, they have, but they don't get a vote. Because I clearly won. Go back and listen to the episode. I I don't like that that results. And I demand you stop counting right before you add that in there. You know what? We, the jury, find you in favor. We will stop the count at five to three. Dan wins. The count is... You demand a recount. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. Yep. Nigel, you continue back on course in your quiz role. I refuse to concede this. Go ahead. All (laughs) right. Usual Dan quiz format. Five questions, all multiple choice, all dealing with John Wayne. Ooh, I'm going to get all of this wrong because I only know like three John Wayne films. Go ahead, Nigel. Three more than me. So since Josh clearly won last week i'll see, let him see he admitted it i will let you go first john wayne famously or infamously portrayed which historical icon a julius caesar b ulysses s grant c genghis khan or d general george Patton. genghis khan yes yes he portrayed genghis khan john wayne born in iowa portrayed a mongol or warlord awesome Awesome. Now I wish I hadn't mentioned that earlier, because I think that's the only reason Josh got that. No, I actually knew that. I actually knew that, because I've seen pictures. It's up there with uh, the Sean Connery film where he's in the red tights. Oh, Zardos. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, we need to get to that movie someday. Anyways. Oh, we absolutely will. I am going to make that happen somehow. (laughs) All right. Tom, this next question is for you. John Wayne's horse was named what? A. Dollar. B, Traveler, C, Sandy, or D, Trigger? Shit, it's not Trigger because that was someone else's horse. I'm going to have to say Sandy. (laughs) Josh? Dollar? Yes, John Wayne's horse was named Dollar. Josh is in the lead at 2-0. I win. It's clearly I'm in the lead, so this is my victory. I'm going to go ahead and claim it now. Well, then, uh, no. (laughs) Okay, Josh, what role did John Wayne famously turn down? A, Dirty Harry Callahan in Dirty Harry. B, the role of General George Patton in Patton. C, the man with no name in A Fistful of Dollars. Or D, James Bond in Dr. No. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Because I know James Bond first being portrayed. Like I want, I, I want to say that that's just an instant remove. Because did you? The uh, fun fact is the first James Bond to be portrayed on screen was not Sean Connery, but it was in a TV show, and he was played by an American. Oh shit! Yeah. Oh wow! I have to look up the details on that one. Um, but I don't think that was it. I don't think I think George C. Scott was al- like always had a lock for Patton. What was the other two options? Dirty Harry and Fistful of Dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the man with no name. I'm gonna go with the man with no name. <clears throat> Tom? Shoot, I'm gonna get it wrong, but I'm gonna say Dirty Harry. Actually, you're right. You're dead on. Holy uh, shit! Yeah, the the role of Dirty Harry. You mentioned in your your uh, expectations that this movie was directed by the same director who directed Dirty Harry. Mm-hmm. And he wanted he wanted almost no one else but John Wayne in the role. But John Wayne turned it down because he just didn't want to do it. And he ended up instantly regretting it when the movie became such a huge hit. That's why he ended up making The Q and Brannigan. Because those movies, John Wayne plays a gruff, plays by his own rules cop. Kind of like a certain Dirty Harry we know. So, oh, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. I can't see anyone but Clint Eastwood, though. That's weird. I, don't, I know. I don't I think know. I've ever seen the movie, but I've seen enough about the movie that I agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, uh, so Josh or Tom, it's your turn at number four. John Wayne won the Oscar for which of his famous films? A. True Grit B. The Sands of Iwo Jima C. The Alamo or D. McClintock Oh shit, I thought I had the movie in my head but it wasn't what I was going to think I was expecting The Searchers but that's, damn. Okay throw, throw those movies at me again One more time A. True Grit B, Sands of Iwo Jima, C, The Alamo, or D, McClintock? Oh, it's definitely not The Alamo, because that movie bombed so hard. I'm going to have to go Sands of Iwo Jima. Mm. Damn it. Josh, which of those roles did John Wayne... That was my idea. (laughs) That was one I was going to pick. Okay, Sam again. A, True Grit, B, Sands of Iwo Jima, which we all know is the wrong answer, C, The Alamo, or D, McClintock? True Grit? Yes, he won the Oscar for True Grit. Son of a bitch. I, as soon as I said Santa Z, with you, I was like, it's gotta be. It's- and technically with that, Josh now wins trivia. Uh, Boom. I can do number five if you want, but... I'm curious to see hear what the fifth one was. Okay. Josh, what was John Wayne's nickname? A, the General, B, the Duke, C, the Man, or D, Pilgrim? Wasn't it the Duke? Yes, it was the Duke. Fucking hell. And Tom's streak starts back up again. (laughs) (laughs) So Josh gets trivia next week. I look forward to trying to guess the IMDB score by Josh reading the fifth sentence of the second paragraph. I won by a landslide. It was the best win ever. Nobody else can win like Uh, me. This is what I'm going to hear every time, isn't it? No, I'm done with this joke. This joke is now dead. I got it for two weeks. It's done. The joke is dead. I'm killing it. I'm killing it. It has officially... I I am annoyed by speaking it. So (laughs) the joke is dead. We will not hear of it again unless one of you two do it. In which case, I'll give you a hard time for stealing my joke. Oh, I promise you, I am not going to Friday the 13th this. I'm keeping Jason buried. (laughs) Oi. Well done, Nigel. Well done, Josh. Thank you. I applaud the winner. That was a, that was a good one there. It was a good one, Dan. Yes. Mostly because I won, but that was a good one. And on that note, I think I'll play the music. Well, howdy, pilgrims. Welcome back to that there shootingest episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and quick draw instructor, Tom. Now the trick to winning a shoot fest, they don't tell you. Shoot the other fella first. There you go. Now that'll be $5,000. Just testing ya. Pardons for any background ambiance. A bit of a twister's rolling around through here. Nothing that could pick up a calf. But it does make that their interspersal chatting a bit noisier than usual. 
But thank you for sticking around through wind and storm with us here at the fire pit. We're picking up and riding out on our first destination and towards our first destination and our flight to the hero's journey. Starting things off with the Superman of Western's last movies ever, which is fitting for a journey that ends with the origin of the Superman. At least that's how I see it. Speaking of seeing it, let's check in on our team as they start off on their own journey to find a hero of their own. What about the commercial? This is from the top. It takes priority. It's from the chief. Okay, so how the hell are we supposed to get a superhero in six friggin' weeks? We are professional podcasters here. This isn't our first crossover rodeo. We just did a whole thing with a bunch of Stephen King movie characters not that long ago. Let's just, I don't know, call one of them up and get them to do a spot. <sighs> one of them was a dog with active rabies. Another one was a murder car. I wouldn't really count those as superheroes. Dan. No, oh, yeah, you're right. And also, we did kind of ditch them to go do the podcast that night. Why don't we just hire one to come on? Can you do that? I don't see why not. I mean, those capes don't pay for themselves, right? Well, we have to take licensing into consideration, too. Licensing? Superhero licensing. It takes a lot more to be in a hero than just powers. Without licensing, anyone can just run around in your costume with your name and rake in all those lucrative benefits and licensing deals. And they gotta protect their intellectual property. They gotta protect their intellectual property. Hell, you can't even mention most heroes' names because of licensing. Interesting. Okay, so what about b That definitely doesn't sound like we're gonna be able to use that one. Maybe we should think smaller? How about fl- I guess not. What about w Shit, really? How about we get- Wait, d Gee, how small is our budget? Biff Man! Who? Hey, I remember Biff Man. He was b brother. He was used for some car commercials in our old hometown. Yeah, to capitalize on the 89 Batman movie. Huh. So I guess you could say the movie Batman, but you can't say b Okay, so that's at least one hero we can afford. I'll try some other hero names just in case there's one more that we can possibly afford. And I guess I'll get to work reaching out to... Ugh, Biff Man. And maybe I can toss a Craigslist out there, see who we can find, using my PC from Rob's Custom PCs. Woo! They sure have found themselves in a humdinger, haven't they? Now, if you happen to have any ideas on how they can get themselves a hero guest, or if you have any ideas, period, that you'd like to share, feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line, as well as what you're emailing in regards, and let us know what you have. Whether you have an ad for us to advertise, a destination to head towards, a path to take, or just general thoughts or input, and we'll take that there missive, give it the thorough read through, and toss it in a fire without ever responding. Whew, we're shooting not responderists. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I at gmail.com. There's something already with the shooting. Best get you back to the podcast. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. Hey, what's the hat, y'all? It's new! And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. God, it isn't a first in the road without a technical difficulty, isn't it? Tradition! Tradition. Is Ron Howard doing the voiceover for this? Oh is this an arrested, <laughs> it's an arrested development situation? I think it is. Oh, I'm going to okay. milk this one so much, guys. <laughs> Damn, Did John. Did you see that ketchup pack explode? Got me right in the hinds, man. Hey, there's our guy. Oh, my God. God, was he ever not old? And Mr. Smith, he's pretty young. That was it. <laughs> the war ages people, Josh. Not just that, but it's like, this is 76. He looks like he should be a grandpa. He is he a grandpa at this point. another 30 years. 
He died 21 years later after this movie was released. How old was he? Not boy, it's Gillum Rogers. I'm going to direct Solo in the future. Well, hello, Grandma. I don't know what that means. <laughs> what, what, you have a fine color when you're on the scrap? I mean, I swear, I'm going to say that line at work tomorrow, and I'm just going to see what happens. Guys, I might be unemployed again by Sunday. My pants will be down, and I'll be blindfolded. Gillum will be happy to do this. He wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have so much fun with this. Oh, you're <laughs> you know, nice guy. I love reaching for the paper and the guy shit his pants. How many times do you think they had to reshoot that scene? Uh, actually, this movie suffered a serious delay in filming. They filmed it in Colorado, and John Wayne had already had a lung removed about four or five years prior to this movie being made for lung cancer. So he had a whole lung removed, and they filmed it in Colorado, and the thin air gave him an awful, awful influenza. Ugh. Like, they had to delay filming, like, almost a month because uh, it, it got so bad for him. His doctors were like, well, you guys can't see my fingers, but they were, like, this close to just telling him, you can't film this movie unless they change locations. And they didn't have the budget to change locations. Shit. So he's in this film days away from dying, and in real life, he was days away from dying, pretty much. Years away. He dies three years after this movie comes out. He dies in 1979. Son of a bitch. I can see why they went meta with a lot of it, because, whew. And you've been drinking. I'm 12 years old, of course I'm drinking. I want a second opinion. Jimmy Stewart's character is his second opinion. I want a third opinion. I'm putting a gun in this guy's mouth, what does it look like I'm doing? You could say he has an oral fixation. Now he has an anal fixation. To work with your sympathy of the will. Raise the lakes, the hills, the sky. A.K.A. I want to get my dick wet. Off-road vehicle. Ron Howard narrating. She did. <laughs> Damn it, you got it, Nigel. <laughs> oh, my what? God. What's that? This movie. Slow. Painful. Damn it, I wish they had you to ride with. Ride me. Ride, <laughs> ride me. Not ride with me. Ride me. Monday morning, you're going to bring me a headstone. Small headstone. What is this, Red? Sir, this says suck my left nut. <laughs> word for word. <laughs> Trying to use the Snapchat filters on John Wayne. <laughs> I wondered what was going on with that. What are you doing to the Duke, Josh? Well, they have the feminine features one. He doesn't make a pretty woman. Josh, why are you trying to defame John Wayne like this? I don't think I have to do that at all. Kill him. I want you to kill him. <laughs> Prove your loyalty to me. See, I, I couldn't have a clever idiom like he had. You have a fine color for being on the scrap. I'd be like, you look good for being a whore. <laughs> Snide Snidely off on his way to kidnap another girl and put her on the train tracks. <laughs> How much longer does this movie have? Four hours. We're about three quarters of the way through. It's got about 20 minutes left, Josh. So about four long. about four hours in movie time. Yeah, so so in uh shootest inflation time, about <laughs> nine hundred minutes. <Yeah. laughs> I would. She did. <laughs> and Josh got his in. Are you wearing oh, you're clothed. Never mind. Oh. You see that plunging neckline though? Yeah, that was risque back then. She is just slutting it up right now. Yeah. If she was showing her ankles, she'd be all like Take me now. God, look at that whore. Yeah. Look at her. Like, oh my God, I can see her ankles. Will somebody please think of the children? Wait, why does my the subtitle say my last day? How is this <laughs> my last day? What the fuck is going on today? Are you banging my mom? I would be if you weren't here right now. Get out of here. Oh, God damn no it, problem. mom. I'll watch. I, I'm, I'm, I'm here to learn. <laughs> God damn it, mom. If you don't bang him, I will. I think we're finally getting to the shootout scene. Feels like we've taken how long was the Lord of the Rings movies? The extended editions? Four and a half hours. No, no, he means all of them. All of them. <laughs> Ten hours. <laughs> this is double that. Yeah, you wanna come? I'm gonna shoot people. <laughs> this is gonna be great. That guy I killed all of his brothers, I'm gonna kill him too. This is great. <laughs> My life is awesome. <laughs> Even with the cancer. Because I killed that dude's brothers. This movie's better if he's a villain. <laughs> <laughs>
He's hardcore. You know how I know? How's that? I don't. <laughs> you hide your erection. I can feel you, son. I shouldn't feel this. <laughs> this is weird. Oh, stepmother. No! No! <laughs> no! Stop that now! Is that Ian McKellum? No. This is not actually the Lord of the Rings. It just feels like the same length of all no, of that the kid, That guy looks like he's about to go find Roto and Frodo and throw the one ring into Mount Doom. No, it's this is it's Roto. It's it's the non licensed <laughs> yeah, of of Roto. <laughs> and the Elmo name, Haggins. Yeah, the names have been changed to protect our lawyers. <laughs> so why why does the uh, off brand David Hasselhoff want to kill him? Because he's but, not the real David Hasselhoff, and they're always pissed. He knows what David Hasselhoff grows to be, the Hoff, and it could have been him. He could have drove around in the nice black car, and saved people. And then later got to run in slow motion on a beach with Pamela Anderson in her boobies. It said, he's got to kill old John Wayne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who is covered in ketchup. The indignity seethes inside of him. Camping. You camping bitch. Look at you cornering. Oh my god. Noob. Why don't you just put a fucking claymore down there to make and just make it official. You know... You can say what you want about the mummy, but at least when we get to it, things happen. Lots well, well, of things happen. Well, plenty of things have happened in this film. He had his suit dry clean. <laughs> he, got he got his hair tomb- cut. He, yeah. he got a tombstone. He's talked to Lauren Bacall a hundred times. He read a newspaper. Know. He burned a newspaper. I mean, this has been a pretty busy film, guys. He took a uh, carriage ride to a lake. He talked to Jimmy Stewart twice and he drank some cocaine all in all not bad and that was arrested development oh thank god and now back to the episode all right so who's in charge of the summary this week uh, uh, I believe that's Tom. Well, this should be a short summary, if anything. Okay, so the shootest. So we start off with a kind of a brief synopsis on what is essentially John Wayne's career. He plays J.B. Brooks in this gunfighter. It's a John Wayne film starring John Wayne. He is now in his well old age. He goes to a town to meet Jimmy Stewart, who plays Dr. Hostelter. Hostelter? Yep, that's close enough. He tells him, hey, my back's kind of sore. And Jimmy says, yeah, you have cancer. You're going to die in a few days, weeks, maybe. So I was like, okay. So he gets a and b ran by Lauren Bacall and her son, Ron Howard. And, well, he tells Lauren Bacall's character that he's going to die and winds up telling the sheriff, Harry Morgan, who plays Marshall Fibden. And he's like, keep it under your hat. So he tells everyone, and there's a brief moment where people try to kill him, but he kills them first. And then he goes about, spends a, two hours running errands and chores. He gets his suit pressed, gets a haircut, gets a gravestone, and convinces the sheriff to get some people out of jail uh, so he can shoot fight them. Because uh, Jimmy Stewart said at the beginning, he's like, hey, the way you're going to die from this is pretty bad. You probably don't want to die from cancer. So he arranges a gunfight in the saloon uh, in the hopes that at least one of them will kill him. And he kills all three of them that are there, including the, um, I guess, poker dealer or whatever who's in on it. So he thinks, oh, shit, I'm going to live through this. But then the bartender kills him. And then Opie, uh, Ron Howard, kills the bartender. And apparently that's a happily ever after. And he goes home with his mom. And that's the end of the film. But I just saved you two long hours. If that sounds like a very curt summary, that's about all that happens in the film. Guys. Yeah, seriously. Seriously. Yeah. That was a terrible summary, but it was a good summary for a terrible film. Well, and let's hope your final thoughts aren't nearly as curt. So, Tom, what are your final thoughts going into this film? I see what it wanted to do. It just didn't do it well. I was... Mm. I, near the end of it, I kind of got... A vision of Pathfinder, and this film is kind of the flip side of Pathfinder. Pathfinder was a whole bunch of nothing 
happening, but just them throwing a whole bunch of shit to make like things were happening. This film where it was going towards something, it had a goal, but oh my God, nothing was happening to build towards it. Just running errands? Really? I said when we were watching that as if I was a fan of Westerns and John Wayne films, especially of the past, this would probably be like a wow kind of thing, a nostalgic tearjerker, especially knowing that John Wayne had cancer and probably was going to die while making this film. But aside from that, there wasn't really anything to it. I had one splurt of something happening just to wake people up. And that was it. I noted there was a grim melancholy about it. I have a little bit more, but I want to hear the rest of your guys' thoughts before we go deeper. Josh, <laughs> I am looking forward to your thoughts. What are you thinking here? I absolutely loved this film. <laughs> I felt that it was uh, an amazing way to close out a career, a long career of a fantastic actor. And they, just all of the way that this thing came together and culminated into that final scene, just it just made sense. And I I just can't say, 10 out of 10 for me, I just I can't wait to watch it again. Now, is wait, what wait, a wait. crazy man would say. <laughs> <laughs> There's that punchline. There, there we go. go. No, this movie was terrible. I fell asleep. I, at least I felt like I fell asleep. It was uh, 110 minutes too long. Um <laughs> Seriously, we watched a man do chores, get his hair cut, pick out a headstone, sell his horse. And buy it back. And buy it back. Take a lady for a stroll that nothing came of. God, this movie sucked. It was just <laughs> bad. Like, honestly, most movies I pay attention to. Even, like, Swashbuckler. I paid more attention to Swashbuckler than I did this one. Mm -hmm. This movie fucking put me to sleep. It's like, okay, I get it. And then the, like, okay, the ketchup packet blood. Well, that was I will give that a little bit, a little bit of leeway, given that this is a movie made in 1976. I mean, it did come out the same year as Swashbuckler. Mm -hmm, oh, mm -hmm. my, no, this, this movie wasn't good. I didn't like it. I found myself on my phone, a large portion of it. I had yeah. to go get a snack, and I didn't care to pause it. And I didn't miss anything. I was gone for like three or four minutes, and I didn't miss anything. Why is it that good actors go out on bad films? You know, it's just like you had a great career and then you get this movie to go out on and it's crap. Well, I think that's the old wrestling adage that all good wrestlers go out on their backs. Uh, I, I guess. I mean, it's not on purpose, I know, but still. <laughs> well, no, you know, but in, in wrestling, it's tradition because the reason why you go out on your back in professional wrestling or why you're supposed to is you're supposed to be you're supposed to be putting over someone else strong to take your place. Mm -hmm. And that's why you go out on your back in wrestling. And but Dan's explanation that he just finished was more exciting this this entire movie. <laughs> like, I was actually paying attention to Dan, unlike I was with this movie. And I hate wrestling. I, I could give a shit less. But that was more entertaining than this movie. <laughs> so, Dan, what are your final thoughts? Well... I can see why this movie has such a high rating on Rotten Tomatoes in IMDb. And it's not because it's that good. I think it's more of a fondness for John Wayne. It's his last film. So I think maybe it gets a higher rating than it maybe deserves because it was his last film. I do see some of that, like, unironically, people telling me that, oh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen's not that bad because it was Sean Connery's last film when it's pretty shit. I wouldn't say this movie's as bad as League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but this movie was very claustrophobic most of the movie takes place in lauren bacall's character's house mm -hmm. and most of it takes place in his room like most of the movie takes place in his bedroom that he's renting in that house by the way i talked earlier that the budget had been slashed in this movie like i guess the original idea was he was supposed to spend almost the whole movie fighting off would-be people that kept coming into this town to get one last try at jb books before he dies of natural causes and they couldn't afford to film a lot of it outdoors. So instead of having this big gunfight through the town, which was originally planned, he had to have a gunfight in a small saloon. And like he only got one scene of that, which is when they, they crashed his bedroom at night and he fought him off. And whatever scene doesn't take place in that room takes place in other rooms. This movie takes place almost entirely indoors. And it feels so claustrophobic because they couldn't do anything else but just have a bunch of really good actors like John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart and Lauren Bacall and Ron Howard sit around and talk. That would have been fine if the movie wasn't called The Shootist. 
Like, you know, like he's supposed to be a gunfighter and he's sitting around having, you know, coffee and conversation with people. Like I said, the dialogue's good and the acting was good in this movie, but you're just like, you get about halfway through it. You're like, do something, shoot something. It's called the shootest. It's not called, you know, <laughs> the last days of a dying man. It's like, yeah, know, it's so frustrating that this movie was so slowly paced and it's not necessarily the movie's fault. It's the budget's fault. But it's just, like, I think Tom Musa said it a little bit ago. You could see what this movie wanted to be, but it fell well short of the mark. It's frustrating because it's John Wayne, and it's Jimmy Stewart. Although it's not Jimmy Stewart's last film, but it's John Wayne's last film. And it's really sad to see him go out on such a boring note. This is the guy that made McClintock and True Grit and Sands of Iwo Jima and The Flying Tigers. And, like, this guy made amazing movies his entire career and he just mm-hmm. kind of goes out with a whimper and not a bang he wasn't happy with this movie apparently he wasn't happy with parts of the script he wasn't happy with the way he was supposed to kill the last guy he demanded it be changed or he would walked off the set he was supposed to kill the last guy by shooting him in the back he was supposed to go around the bar and flank the guy and shoot him in the back and john wayne refused to do that because he said i went my entire hollywood career Never shooting a man in the back. I'm not going to do it now. I can understand the principle on that one. Yeah. I mean. I digress. That's not what that has to do with the movie. I'm just saying the movie itself is claustrophobic, and mm-hmm. I didn't care for that. I just didn't care for the fact that the movie was called The Shootist, and it's supposed to be the, the last days of a gunfighter trying to go out on his own terms, especially after Jimmy Stewart says, I wouldn't die the way I described you're going to die. But most of the movie is in his bedroom with him talking to various characters, and it gets really boring after about the half hour mark. Yeah, although I slightly disagree. I felt the claustrophobia, especially the emptiness of the house, especially near the end, did add to the grim nature because this is a man dying, so it kind of adds to that lonely feel of it. And kind of in a meta sense, too, just for John Wayne, because I don't know about you guys, but just the way everyone was treating him, like, oh, you're about to die? Can I have your hair? Oh, can I do all this stuff? It's like, was John Wayne dealing with that shit, too, at the time? Are we watching, like, the actual what John Wayne was dealing with as he was dying of cancer? People just like, can I have your hair? Ooh, yeah. Yeah, the movie, it's very, very meta. It's kind of weird how, to sum up J.B. Books' career, they used a lot of stock footage from older John Wayne movies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so this movie is almost like a... I guess maybe the movie was supposed to be a love letter to John Wayne and his career, but it it doesn't really come off that way. You, you, You can see that. You can see exactly what they wanted this film to be. It's like you see the grain of the film, and you mm-hmm. see like what it was originally intended, but they just sanded the wrong way. Like they didn't yeah. sand with the grain; they sanded against it. Yeah, and I'm... just no, it didn't come out right because it was just. What am I doing? A woodworking metaphor for? We we need to know another <laughs> food metaphor. This is like eating <laughs> at the shitty mall Chinese food. If they had like something building towards, it's like we didn't even know. We just imp- figured it out near the end. Oh, he's planning his own suicide if they had something in the background like another guy comes in town or something and there's that looming threat it's like yeah you know he's going to die but he's got one last bit of yeah. business yeah. to finish I'm something pretty, yeah and i really 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 felt that this relationship that he had with with ron howard's character just came off as forced and just so unnatural yes. it's so unnatural like why is ron howard getting upset about this guy not telling him he had cancer. He would have told me. Like He's known you for two days, Skip. He's the audience avatar, especially the young generations. Like, I grew up with you, man. You can't die. You're John Wayne. Don't die. Yeah. I get I get what he was supposed to be, but as we were saying and watching, Josh, you and both of you guys said it's like he was not the right actor for that. Can we just say that Clint Eastwood did it better? Gran Torino? Oh, yeah, yeah. I would say that is much better for a, a, a twilight of a actor's career. You know, I mean, think, thinking about it, that is, it almost feels like I'm not going to call it a remake, but maybe one of those reimaginings, but mm-hmm. it feels very much like, like that was this movie done, right? Sure. I've never seen Gran Torino, but the clips I've seen, it does feel like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what they should have did with John Wayne. Oh yeah. Gran Torino is a good movie and it, ends like with you expecting this amazing shootout i'm not going to spoil it but it subverts expectations in a good way Mm -hmm. this one i just felt sucked 
Yeah, they had to have the shootout at the end because it was a John Wayne film. Mm-hmm. That's Jesus God in the film. It's like, yeah, we have to have the shootout up to you now because I need the shootout. It's, oh my God! Mm. They could have just called this movie "Running Errands." <laughs> yeah, with guns, and I yeah. that would have better described this film. Yeah, yeah th- this is a movie where if I, if, if I was grading it, I would have said C minus. But I know for a fact you were capable of so much better than this. I thought the director did a pretty good job with the movie. And I I liked the acting. I thought the dialogue was good. I thought the acting was really good in the movie. I just thought that it was boring. Agreed. Especially at the end where um, I keep calling him Opie. Because that was his character (laughs) in Andy Griffith's show. Jesus, Ron Howard, like when he's he's killed the bartender, he's going out. They they do that weird, like his world's upside down. Everything's weirdly not quite focused so directorial choices there were good but the music didn't help anything and oh my god i i'm getting more and more pissed off with this with this film as we talk get angry tom this movie Uh, sucked it started off in my opinion really good I, i didn't mind opening up with the clips of john wayne and even that opening scene with him shooting the uh mugger guy I thought that wasn't terrible. I'm like, okay, well, that wasn't bad. I, m- maybe it'll get better. It doesn't get better. And then, and then when he gets into town and the one guy goes to pull his gun and Wayne goes, try it. Mm-hmm. You know, and he just it's stops. Like they try to build up this character as being a badass. You're like, ooh, what are they going to do next? Okay. Okay. Come on. Yeah. Okay, yeah. what's on my phone? <laughs> yeah. And I did like the scene where he made the Marshall shit his pants. Like, I thought that was cleverly done. But this movie was flashes of brilliance with long, long periods of mediocre. I feel like the pitch <laughs> for this movie was better than the movie. Yeah. 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 Oh, well. At least the film after this one's a guaranteed banger. Well, that's at the peak of John Wayne's career. This, I mean, this is Oscar-winning performance. So we had to get through this film to get there. But uh, you know what? Those are the risks we take. And congratulations, guys. We're continuing our streak of films we've never watched never heard of or we've heard of but we never watched and it turns out we all hate it so the uh the old trend continues yeah yeah, yeah. there was a couple of flukes in there but yeah uh, we, yeah. we all we, we all liked midnight special and we were all indifferent to scary stories <laughs> back to and, form uh, now we all liked flight of the phoenix oh yeah we did like flight of the phoenix yes we did oh my god all right but i th- i think we've um Oh, what's an old-timey euphemism that we can borrow from John Wayne now? Have we gone around the barn with this one, guys? I would... got uh, a good color for being on the scrap. Hashtag, Josh. Yeah. Hashtag. Hashtag on the scrap. <laughs> but yeah, I would say that, uh, what, what would we call on this journey again? The flying... Flying high on the hero's journey. This was a low. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to start on the ground before you, you go do. up, up and away, so, Josh. Yeah, this... This is the ground, so we're the George Reeves about to jump maybe, up. Yeah, maybe he's, we're he's, like Batman Begins, and it just takes us 45 minutes to put the costume on. So this is, we're at the 45-minute mark, and then we'll, uh, yeah, Let's John Wayne. Pray. Dear John Wayne, who art in heaven, please may your next film be better than this one. Hallowed be thy name, a movie that's better than this one. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Spectacles, but, testicles, wallet, watch. Yes. But as always, as a reminder, for those that didn't fall asleep with this movie like we did, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our regular episodes are on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please like and subscribe on whatever medium you choose. We really appreciate it as it helps us out. And uh, be sure to join us on our Discord channel as well. Uh, Link in the episode description and on our site at firepit.podbean.com. You'll get notifications of new episodes and even better or worse, you can chat with us and other listeners. It's a fun time. And be sure to check out our Discord if you're already on there. We shared a uh, video that is our origin story to our image <laughs> <laughs> and our email is mentioned back in the interspersal segment so if you want to send us a message in essay format we'll appreciate it also be sure to like our facebook page tweet us out on twitter and both are linked in the episode description as well and i'd like to start by giving a shout out to some of our new facebook followers we have josh not our josh but a different josh fridge sarah n 
Jinda. I'm not sure if you want us using your full names, but hopefully you know who you are. And a whole bunch of others who just decided to like and follow our page. My apologies for not naming you all right here, but I promise we'll give you some kudos as we go. And whether you're starting on this episode or the first episode or wherever, there's always room next to the fire and we're glad to have you. And I'd like to give a shout out to my friend Tim, not Tom, an old friend from high school. One of the, literally the only one I still talk to. I just told him about the podcast and hopefully he'll listen and hear the shout out. And shout out to my beautiful wife who puts up with my ass, even though I turn her down and be like, I'm going to go record a podcast with my friends and leave you by yourself. So she puts up with me. So shout out to her. And I obviously will give a special shout out to Peggy, friend of the channel. Thanks always for listening. Thanks always for uh, helping us out on the podcast when you can. It's always appreciated. Also, another shout out to uh, my good friend, Nick, who just joined the podcast, joined our Discord uh, yesterday. So welcome aboard, Nick. Hope you're enjoying the show. I warned you to stay away from the first three episodes and you didn't listen. So I'm sorry, but I gave you a chance and I gave you an out and you didn't listen. But thanks for listening. And I'm glad you're it's on you now. It. Yeah, it's yeah. on you now. And but you're, you're you've passed that and you're still listening and you joined the Discord. So. That's awesome. Also, a shout out to Rob at Rob's Custom PCs for always having our backs. And for anyone else out there who we haven't mentioned, new listeners, old listeners, and everyone else, thank you for joining. We appreciate it. And keep those fire pit fires burning. You've got mail. Oh, hey, hey, we got a reply from Biffman. Wait, holy shit, what? He exists and apparently is alive. And an actual hero now. He says that he'd love to be on the show. Oh nice! See, what did I tell you? It all works out. Okay, wow. Uh, did he say when he'll be able to come in and run through everything with us? Uh, I'm opening the email and reading it now. Something about tactic crossover, reality eating cute. My God. Time dilation. Uh, 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 2026. Okay, <sighs> let's just uh, face it, guys. I really don't think we're going to be able to pull this off. <sighs> <sighs> So, uh, Tom, why don't you tell us what we're watching next week? Oh, guys, we're going to be hopping back on the saddle, and we are going to be riding off with John Wayne into the classic Western and one of his best Westerns, True Grit. Oh, that's awesome. Clips. That's the one with Matt Damon. No, no gosh. that's the remake. This is the original. Oh, the one with Josh Brolin. No. Absolutely not. Okay, the one with the dude. No. 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 I don't watch a lot of westerns. <laughs> Obviously not, but you'll like this one. This one's a good one. If you've seen the remake and you enjoyed it, you'll like this one. Although be warned that John Wayne and Jeff Bridges' version of Rooster Cogburn are completely different characters. I not in a bad way. Remake. Oh, yeah. I don't know if oh. you've heard. I don't know if you've heard. I'm not a fan of westerns. We'll have to work on that with you, Josh. But until next time, I've been Tom. And I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. I have a plan. Ooh, Dan has a plan. Dan has a plan. I know how we can get a hero on our show, and it might just be crazy enough to work. Okay, okay, here's the plan. All we gotta do is... What is Dan's plan? Can our team find out a way to get a superhero onto their podcast? Or are they doomed to failure? Find out next time, same fire pit time, same fire pit channel.